recording yet? All right, so today uh, I'm going to give a tour of the HTT data repositories. Um, and uh, so I think I'm sharing my screen now. And I'm going to get rid of this uh, awkward thing at the top because I'm going to need to see at the very top of my screen. And I'm going to keep it as um, showing like this where I can jump around the slides as I need to. Um, so, right, uh, wow, big turnout today. I'm Brandon Gallus in, in Bitzer at, at the FDA. Um, and let's just get started. And I do set things up in this first. And I guess my animations won't work here, but um, I just want to start by saying there are different audiences here today uh, and with different goals, really, in the bottom line. And um, the idea is that there's going to be rookies with respect to R and RStudio and Git and GitHub. Um, there's also collaborators that want clarity on the data so that they can explore it uh, and use it properly. And then there's teammates um, that have been already analyzing the data. And then there's collaborators and colleagues that want to see kind of the, the front end of this work on new, um, I don't know about new, but uh, agreement measures for quantitative values that are coming from pathologists. Uh, and then really this is for any, any type of reader clinician um, providing quantitative estimates of something. So. I'm going to focus mostly on the first two pieces. That, that's the priority today. And, and it'll take about 30, 40 minutes to make sure we get through uh, these first two elements. And then the, the last 10 to 20 minutes we'll spend on, on the agreement value, agreement metrics for quantitative values. And it's just a sketch to show you where we're going, um, at least the, one of the directions we're taking right now. Um, so let me uh, mention that. A case, when I use the word case, it's really going to be referring to a region of interest because we have uh, the data we've collected are coming from 64 whole slide images. And then there's 10 regions of interest on each one of these images. That's the kind of cases, those 640 regions of interest from 64 images. Um, and the modalities we're collecting this data on, we have two digital modalities. Uh, one is called CA Microscope, the other is called Path Presenter. And then we have a microscope platform. And unfortunately, during the pandemic, we weren't able to collect too much data on this microscope platform because it is a live uh, a, a platform that uses the glass slides. And that's a whole other talk. Now, how, how do you do it on the glass slides and in the digital mode um, is a different, different talk. Um, but just for some words, STIL refers to stromal tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Um, that's something that's a prognostic biomarker for um, cancer. And I think most cancers, uh, we're gonna be looking at, uh, we're, our project is mostly concerned with breast cancer. And so this, the images that we're talking about are from uh, biopsies in breast cancer. And the data collection goes like this. The, the pathologist, uh, starts and they have a region of interest that is shown in front of them. And the first question they're asked is to classify that ROI. And this classification currently is four descriptive labels of what kind of tissue they're looking at. Is this tissue with tumor or not? And then if it has tumor, is there stroma or not? And, um, and so that's the four different categories basically. Uh, uh, kind of break down. And one of those categories really boils down to, there's not even any tissue here. It's like an other category. Could be normal tissue is also other. Necrotic tissue also falls into this bucket of other. But there's four basic labels and they split out into two that should be evaluated and two that should not be evaluated. So that's something I want to introduce up front. Um, if the ROI label is appropriate, then they're supposed to estimate the percent of tumor associated stroma because that's where these tills are, are, are found. Um, and that's how we treat, train the pathologist to do their, their data their evaluation is to find the stroma. So there's a segmentation process in this, uh, in, this, um, in this task. And then if there's percent stroma is bigger than zero, then do your density estimate. We only want to count the density or estimate the density within the tumor associated stroma. So there has to be tumor, there has to be stroma, and then we will get to the uh, till density. And it's an area, over area, 
it is a density in the, in the natural idea of what density means. All right, so that's kind of setting the stage and uh, didn't take too long, hopefully, hopefully, happily. Um, I want to talk about the different repositories we have. We have a public repository, and this is where I'll remind everyone, if you want access to the private repository, the development repository, everybody here is a, con a collaborator of sorts, um, and I'd be happy to give you access to uh, the private repositories as I discuss it. But there's a public repository, and let's take a quick look at that. And we're gonna look at the README. The README, this is kind of what it looks like. This is what it looks like. Um, basically, this package includes data, scripts, and functions for the project. This is public, so it's kind of like a what is ready for, for sharing, um, whereas the private ones will be things that are still works in progress. This is just the link to this repository. Uh, the, the repository is just HTT for the High Throughput Truthing Project. There's a ma user manual for the objects in the um, repository in the R data package. So I wanna make sure everybody understand that there's a repository on GitHub, and then this repository can be compiled to create an R data package. Those are two different ideas. The repository holds all the source code. The R data package kind of gets it ready so it's immediately um, available for um, use in R, okay? I hope everyone understands that. Um, and I wanna make sure everyone knows you can interrupt me at any time because there is a lot of introductory stuff here. Um, please, if you don't understand something, raise your hand. If we take too long on an item, I'm gonna ask to keep moving. But um, uh, like I said, there's gonna be a lot of R, there's gonna be a lot of Git, maybe not too much Git, but a little bit up front. We have a manuscript describing the project, which also describes the data and everything that we're doing. Um, it's actually, this is an archive, an archive, but we've got a, uh, the, pub, the peer reviewed publication is out finally. I just haven't updated this readme. And then version 1.0 of this public repository uh, was shared over the summer. And it really is to share the data and scripts and functions that were used for my pathology informatics presentation. And actually there's also a JSM presentation. Um, and here's a link to uh, the, the description of the presentation. And actually, the slides are here as well. Um, and then the R Markdown file. And that's the nice thing about R is you can create these R Markdown files that show you exactly the steps that were done to create the figures that are in this presentation. All right. Any questions on the public repository so far? This is open to the public. Anybody should be able to access this one. Um, and you can see over here on the right-hand side, depending on the size of your screen, it might move around, but there's a releases page. And so I've pre-compiled the, the repository as an R data package. And these are the two R data packages formats. The, uh, this one is the source file. Uh, this is one is as binary for R, okay? So all you need to do if you're an R person is download one of these and install it in R and you'll be ready to go with the data and the scripts. Um, pause just for a moment in case anyone had a question. Yeah, uh, I was gonna say there's there's also another way of doing it that I'll, I'll put that in the chat. Uh, if you have the DevTools uh, library. All right, I'm gonna get to that, Stephen. Oh, right, go ahead and put the link in the chat. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I definitely want to get to that. Um, I want to remind everybody or I just practice with Kate a little bit a little ago, so I might forget whether I said things or not. But there's three repositories, but there's only one R data package because I don't want to change the names of everything as we go from repository to repository because these are all kind of um, fluid in the development chain. The public repository has everything ready for public consumption. The private repository is, is available to collaborators and um, you're welcome to get it. It has more, it has new data and I'll jump to that in a second. And then there's a branch of the private repository and that's where I do most of my work, um, current work. And, and I recommend anyone else, when you're doing work, you do it in a branch so that uh, you can leave the main repository alone. So we just, we're talking about download options. There's an explicit download option on the repository 
that's these two buttons. This will download the source, the repository as a bunch of source files. Uh, you can also get to this source by going to this code button and download uh, this, this, this repository as a zip file. And that makes, when you download it, there's no real connection to the GitHub anymore. So any updates that happen in GitHub, you, you'll be kind of cut off from that. You'll have to manually do any updating. Um, and so there's other ways to update or there's other ways to download. And I think that's what Stephen was gonna get to. Um, you can clone a copy of the repository. Uh, but if you clone the copy of the repositories I have, you won't be able to push to them because I, I like to control what goes in and out. Um, so if you want to be able to push to the repository at some point, you want to fork and then clone. And by clone, it, what it means is you're taking a copy, putting it on your local machine, but you're maintaining a relationship with the, the server version. Um, and uh, and uh, I'm uh, happy to see that uh, uh, Stephen started to outline some steps to doing that. And I'm happy to come online for some of my Bitsert colleagues to help with that. If you need. Um, Brandon, yep. I wonder if, um... Why do we need to fork? Because if you want to contribute, why don't we just uh, make it make it a requirement that nothing gets merged without um, um, you know a pull request and review? Sure, uh, that's because um, uh, I don't know. Maybe forking is not required, but I'm not. I, I, there's enough people involved that I don't want to the the main repository to just. Um, be open to anybody in, that I give access to because I am very liberal with access to the development repository. So I mm -hmm. kind of still want to control it. So uh, the way I know about it is to fork and then um, then you can do pull requests across the forks. I see, I see. Yeah, sure, that works too. Um, and that way it's yours. You play with it all you want. If you never want to come back and, and upload or push anything, you don't have to you can own it. Um, but it will actually stay private on GitHub. And um, because the original, the, the development repository itself is private. And so that attribute passes on to the, um, the forks that are created. So you would have to actively push, a, a create a repository on GitHub um, with this data that I would rather you not make private and public. Uh, so keep it private for the collaborators rather than open to the wide, wide world. Um, and a real quick look at the HTT dev repository. You can see this pull down. This is how you jump between branches. Uh, you got the master branch. That's the one that uh, I like to keep a little slow in updating. And then I'm doing all my work in this rename training cases. Uh, so I can uh, not worry about how it messes up the master branch and uh, and then there's this HTT public branch, which is kind of a, a mirror of what the public one looks like. Um, I don't know how useful that would be, but um, so all the objects are the same across all these different branches and repositories. And that's where um, you'll be able to uh, be able to do some development in any of those, and it should work in the others. And if it doesn't, um, let me know because we want to know why. All right. Any questions? I'm happy to help uh, anybody here on compiling and copying and cloning, but not, not today. We'll do that another day. Um, and that's because I got a lot of DidSert colleagues and, and uh, here, and I want to make sure that they do what they want to do. All right. So what is in these repositories? The primary data object is this pilot HTT. It's a data frame. You can see I use the function str on this object to see what it is. That's a handy little function in R to see what something is. And it's telling us it's a data frame. That just means it's like a, uh, it's like a table, but it allows for all sorts of different data types, you know, characters and numbers. Um, and there's 7,818 rows, and then there's 18 columns and the columns uh, correspond to the different uh, variable types. So you can see the whole list of different variables that are in this data frame. And I'm cutting and showing some of them here. Uh, and I'll, I'll get more detail on that in just a second. 
in a lot of my code, I have a generic name for a data frame that has some very specific variables. And I, had, and I used MRMC BF or multi-reader, multi-case data frame. Um, and the primary variables in this data frame is the reader ID, the case ID, the modality ID, and this score. So because I use it in a lot of different places and other development efforts, this score is very generic. So um, you can see down here, we've got those key variables, the case ID, the reader ID, the modality ID, and the score. Now this score, you could put in the till density, you could put in the percent stroma, you could put in the label ROI, the, 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 the classification, the one of four categories. But um, uh, it, it's, it's initialized with the till density because that's the, that's the heart of our project. So you can see the score here um, looks like it was actually a log that was applied. So this, what I cut and paste here is um, the score is actually a log of the density of till. So you can put whatever we want here for a lot of the analysis. And, um, and you just have to be careful about what you put there because that's the primary focus of assessment. Any questions on this primary data object? Because that's what I hope um, uh, was requested in terms of this is the primary data to do analyses. Uh, definitions, so like VTA. Okay, so let's get into what I'm showing here. Um, uh, I do get into case ID, it's a factor. You can see it written as a factor. If you don't know about what factors are, I'm gonna talk about that in just a second. Um, but basically uh, it's not, well, I'll get to that in just a second. So experience is the experience level of the reader uh, the, as the resident. And I'm gonna talk about those two columns in just a second. Um, and really the VTA is a little bit defunct, but uh, you got the labels. The VTA, that is actually correlates with um, whether the label indicates that it is a region of interest to be evaluated. So if there is tumor associated stroma, then VTA will be true. If there is no tumor associated stroma, then VTA will be false. So it's, uh, and uh, that's, that's you can actually get this information in other ways, but that's what that uh, variable means. Does that make sense, Stephen? Okay, thank you. Um, so we're gonna look at a few more our data objects, in fact, the readers, which we were just mentioning here. And I'm gonna, uh, one of the, uh, the handy functions in R is this view function. And so if we do a view, it shows it in the, the top frame like right here and you can see it's a column with all the reader ids the experience level so you can see when it's a negative one and negative one for both of these it's an engineer who was playing with the the platform um, but they're not data collection folks um, and then we have pathologists so pathologist has a number under experience and this is the number of years they've been a board certified pathologist and a lot of this should be in the documentation. So Tommy, please check it out and let me know if it's not there. Um, we have some residents, so they're not pathologists, but they have a few years of uh, residency. Um, this obviously is, we've got a little buggy here. Uh, need to clean up because no one would be, well, no one would be able to deal with a hundred years of residency. I think they would quit by then. Um, and then some of our readers did not fill out the participant registration information. So I don't know for sure what their amount of experience are. I am fairly confident that they're all pathologists, um, mostly because they, there is significant data and only a pathologist would sit around to do an updated collection. But, uh, and I also know who invited all the folks. So we do have like um, 51 readers and we count the engineers. Back to the slides. Um, you can see I've been referring to data objects starting with the name of the data package. And so I just want to make sure everybody knows that if you run this fun function, um, it installs all the objects. So um, we can now just do clean readers without the, the HTT colon colon 
um, in order to start accessing objects within the package. And just so you know, I've already talked about what the names mean. Um, so back to factors. You can see that um, in the original thing that the reader ID and these others are factors. So what does that mean? Well, there are these two functions that are nice that you tell us. Uh, I guess I haven't done the library function yet. And hopefully now, it'll tell me all the pathologists that are, uh, are in my pilot HTT data frame. So remember, this is my main data frame. And then the reader ID is the column of 7,818 um, rows of data, and each one indicates a reader. And these are the number, of, these are the readers that provided that data. So, um, so Brandon, when you say there's information available in the documentation um, for defining these values, yes. uh, how would one find those in, in your R Studio, for example? Sure. So once I type this, and actually before it, you can go to your packages tab, scroll down and look for HTT. Um, it's not in the base package, it's in this library of additional packages, and here it is. Click on it, and here's the documentation of all the objects and functions. So for example, uh, pilot HTT, you know, this file is the aggregate of all clean data from the project. Um, it's been cleaned up PII, um, and then it's describing each of the columns and telling you what kind of data type it is. Is that, that what you were asking for? Yeah, I was just uh, looking for it. Um, that's going to be different from if you use the install GitHub method. Uh, I actually don't see it. So that's something that I so learned. When you, all right, so that's what you need to do. When you build it here, what you need to do is come down to more uh, and configure your build tools. And one of the key checkboxes you want to do is um, generate document. Look, I don't even have it. Generate documentation with, um, and make sure this one is cut because this was not checked by default. Install and restart. You want to create the documentation when you click the install and restart button. Right? Does that make sense? Yep. Um, all right, so that's that's how you install. That's how you build the package from inside our studio, and how you make sure you get the documentation. Thanks for stopping me, because th those are the key pieces. Everybody, uh, you want to know how to get that help. And, and please, I would add, you know, it's it's such a, a contribution to read some of those to make sure that they're useful and accurate. But we talked about the, the variables that are factors, and I just want to demonstrate how, what's a factor? A factor is something that has two states. It's an index and a value. So it's like we had red, green, and blue balls. Those are, that should be a factor because there's three categories. Now we could assign an index to them. So it'd be red, green, and blue is one, two, three. So they have the descriptor of red, green, and blue, and they have the index of one, two, and three. And so you can see that by um, grabbing one of these and showing that as, if we interpret it as a character, and you can force R to do this with the as character. You'll see it comes up as pathologist. And if we do this as a numeric, it will then give me the index value for that factor. So it has two representations, and I make use of these two representations in a lot of the work um, because they have a lot of things related to lists, and that's what I'm going to show next really quick. So I use factors to split the data. So I'm going to create a list of reader-specific data frames. So we got the result, and we're splitting it. Uh, what are we splitting it by? We're splitting it by the reader ID. So you give it the whole data frame, 
And then you give it the factor uh, that you want to split it on. And so I'm gonna do that right here. And so now we can do results one, what kind of data object is this guy? So we're, we're referring to the first element in the list. And you can see it's a list. If you look in your environment, we have results. It's a large list of 33 elements. What are those 33 elements? Well, first, let's do that actually. Names, result, will tell us, oh, it's each list element corresponds to one of the readers, right? Because I split it on the reader. And now what's in these lists? Well, let's look at one of them. And I'm gonna just take the first one. Well, it's a list element. That's what you get when you use a single bracket right here. It's a list element. And inside this list element is a data frame. It's our, our data frame that we're, we've shown before now, but there's only 72 observations because um, it's the observations from this pathologist only. So if we look at this, or let, let's maybe do one more thing first. If we put a double bracket around this sucker, it doesn't return a list element, it returns what's inside that list element. And that list element, what's inside that list element is just a data frame, okay? And so if we take a look at that data frame, What we'll see is that the reader ID is only pathologist 2240, all right? So what I've done is I've created a list. Each element of the list has a data frame and every data frame in this list corresponds to one and only one of the pathologists, all right? Any questions? And that's a really handy thing to have because we're gonna do anal analyses by pathologist. So um, I wanna show, I think this show up the right way. So let's look at the levels of this result for that first one, which was the data frame. Uh, but I want to see it for the reader. So this data frame remembers all of the original levels, even though only one reader is, is in here. Okay, so you might want to be careful of that from time to time. Um, the levels it remembers corresponds to the original, even if there's only one left. So you can refactor that. So what I'm gonna do really kind of intensely right here, I'm gonna refactor that right here. And now if you use this factor function, it will kind of get rid of all the, the factors that don't exist in the actual data frame. And so then there will only be one level left. All right. Um, Timing is not in my favor, um, but I, this is key information. If you have any questions, I, I wanna make sure I slow down here. All right. So that, that reader's data frame, I see that the columns are there. The columns are shared with the pilot HTT. Can we uh, safely assume that those are the same values and it's just an alternative representation of the same data? It's, it's like the subset. Basically, all I've done is taken that data frame, the big one, found the ones corresponding to uh, each reader, and for the moment, 2240, and just put them in that list uh, as is, no, no changes. With this, um, with this function, uh, with this function right here, the split function. All it does is take your big data frame and split it into many smaller data frames. No changes to the data. All right. And now, so now I'm going to get to the recent analyses that I've been doing. Um, and I want to make sure everybody understands the data frames um, that I'm treating. And so that's, I have this function in, uh, the director, one of the directories that I'd like to show really quick. So here's the main uh, repository. This install folder has really all the kind of extra work, the development scripts and, and the analyses. Um, and even if 
if someone is going to do something, I would say put it in your own folder here. So that way we don't have anybody stepping on anyone else's work and having conflicts when we try and uh, push and pull. Um, you can see this folder has data as human readable, comma separated value from uh, comma separated value tables. Um, so you can open this with Excel. So uh, down here is our data. You can download it as a CSV file if that's the way you like to work. And the extra folder now is really where I've been doing all my work. So this is where I did all the work for the pathology informatics conference. And this is where I'm doing all the work right now. And so that's where um, one of the things that I'm working on right now exists, including the function I just mentioned. All right, so this analyze training sets, that's where it is. The first step it does is curate the data to create this results uh, output. And this actually has summary data, but it's really focused on the pilot data, all of the pilot data from the crowd. So if you think of everything in blue is the pilot data from the crowd. And then I wanna talk about that we identified some of these cases for, for more analysis basically. We are creating training sets for pathologists and we identified them and selected the ones that I'm graphically uh, describing here. So I call them training cases, but uh, we might also change that name to select since uh, I don't really like the name training here, uh, but it's still some of the pilot data from the crowd. And then the same cases were evaluated by our experts. So these are the same cases but these are from the crowd and these are from the experts. Right? And you'll get all of them from the, from the pilot HTT data. And this is where I'll jump back to, um, to the repository. And I wanna go to the releases because we've talked, we've, we've seen a lot of the structures now. Uh, and we know that there's modality IV. So the ones that are new from our expert collaborator pathologists, I'm labeling as CA Mike trained. So this is the other modality IVs are CA Mike, and that's from the pilot study in the crowd. There's also a path P, that's also from the pilot study in the crowd. And then there is a um, EDAP, that was the microscope platform. And that's also the pilot study from the crowd. But here we're distinguishing these separately uh, with this modality ID. And also there's a batch label because we split things up. The batches corresponding to the experts are, are given these, these uh, labels. So we consider our collaborators to be collaborating pathologists to be experts because they've read all the materials and they've discussed things together as a team. Um, we did a consensus discussions, um, not fully formally controlled, but um, we were trying to identify why we were getting so much variability and what were features that were uh, causing problems so that we could increase the instructions to pathologists. And that's what the, the, the consensus process was about, was discussing things like that. Uh, but then they actually did the data collection uh, in the formal way after they discuss, so hopefully they are the experts and they trained each other um, on, on what to look for. Um, and the label train was used because the data will support training. And then uh, just so you know how it was selected, we had three kinds of scores, those below 10, those between 10 and 40, and those above 40. And um, so we stratified across those three groups. And then we chose cases with the highest variability because we wanted to find out why is there so much variability? We need to look at those cases. We also looked at some with very low layer variability just so that we didn't ignore those. And we had some of those in our training set. We always need easy ones. Otherwise people get angry. Uh, and everybody understand what the, the training cases are and because that's, that's key. Part of the pilot study, it was then evaluated by our experts so that we can now compare our experts on these select cases to our crowd on these select cases. Right. 
Brandon, this is Miguel. So not all the cases were reviewed by the experts. Is that what I understand that yes. correctly? It was hard enough to get my experts to review these. And there's 72 of these. Remember, the whole pilot study set is 640 ROIs. I remember that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that, that's some significant time. And um, I mean, I would love to have all my experts, but I, I think the whole point here is to try and create training so that the crowd can get to the level of experts or at least in the ballpark, uh, close. And, and um, so that they, we can then recruit the crowd to help us with annotation because that's expensive. Yeah, so, so I, now I understand that the blue section that you have at the bottom is basically those cases that have been reviewed with the expert, by the experts too, effectively, from the 640. Well, the blue indicates crowd, but these two, these two uh, sections correspond to the training cases. They were seen by the crowd and they were seen by our experts. Yeah, yeah. Right, and is that the I just showed you the labels the key labels and in, in the that um, distinguish what from what, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, Just sounds to good. Be Thank clear, you. Here we can look at. Uh, let's see. Do we have the pilot? So let's look at. So seven thousand eight hundred rows here. If we want to filter and we look, what do we have here? We have eight batches. That's the original pilot study. And then we have two training batches. That's where we're identifying the we're identifying cases from up here and just creating two batches using those. Yeah. Okay. This is this is the key to make sure you got the 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 select cases um, because that's what uh, I think that's what I'm focused on right now. So I'll be mostly looking at things in these two areas. And, and for everybody who wasn't part of the project, the reason we're doing, we're doing this effort, effort is that there's, there's so much variability observed in the pilot data from the crowd. And so we needed to have strategies to uh, reduce that variability. And uh, so that's where we, that's what's happening right now. Abhina, did you have a question? All right. Okay. Moving on, so looking at the time, I think I have time to, to walk through a little bit of code because um, my, my team said that that actually is enlightening. Um, and so I'm gonna start with this analyzed training set. And just so you know, our studio, it has this nice lookup table on the right. And this is the button up here to turn it off and turn it on. I love it. And the way to get something to pop out like this is you have to put all these Hashtag at least five hashtags after at the end of your comment or five dashes or five equal signs. I think all those work and then it shows up as a section. Uh, it's really handy. And so I'm going to talk about the training data from the experts. That's something I'm just trying to drill into everybody. That's the thing, the training data from the experts. Um, and what I often do is I uh, once I do a lot of analysis, I, since it takes a while, I save it. And sometimes I just load it from the file. And that's what's happening here. I check to see if the, uh, all my summary analyses are, have already been done and I can just load the file. But this is what I do to begin with. First, I specify a filter date because I like to know if the data changes or I want to control when the data changes. Because if a number changes, I want to know if it's because my code has changed or whether the data has changed. So what I often do is put in a filter date so that I don't get any new changes to the data, all right? And so then I filter the data. You can see this is how R works. You have the data frame, and then you're telling it uh, a logical expression, and this will return trues and falses, and that's how you can um, select specific rows. So this will select the rows where the filter date, where the actual create date is less than the filter date. Um, we're also going to keep only the training data from our experts, right? We're only going to keep these cases down here in this specific um, data frame curated. And we're going to call it um, uh, actually, probably not the best name right here. 
oh wait, here it is, train experts. This is where we're including the training data. And this was the label I gave it from the very beginning. But for the analyses going forward, I have settled on the name of training data. And who's doing it? The experts. And that I'm putting in modality ID. Um, and now we're filtering out some expert that didn't have complete data and it's manually identified. So all I'm doing is taking this one out. We only had four observations. And then here, remember, we talked about refactoring so that the, the data frame I have and the factors represent what's actually in them. And so, and then the last thing that happens is I initialize all sorts of analyses. So I'm gonna jump to that. We're gonna look at that um, really quickly, pausing just in case. All right. So the one thing I wanna walk through is the stats by case because I think it exemplifies how I use factors and then um, and how I do things for multiple cases or multiple readers. So we should split the data by case ID. So this is our data frame. This is our input data frame. This is the case ID factor. So this function will split the data like we've seen before so that every list element is a data frame corresponding to one and only one case ID. So it'll be a small data frame. You know, if nine readers read that case, there'll be nine rows. If two people read it, there'll be two rows and so on and so forth. And then I have a, a function called do stats by case, uh, which looks at all the observations for one case and gives us some basic stats. Um, I think I'd like to see that. And how do I get it quickly? Uh, it's actually an R function. And that means it lives in the R folder, do stats by case. Let me just pop to the bottom. This function returns the batch name, the WSI name, the case ID name, and the modality ID for the specific case. Then it starts counting how many observations there are, how many are evaluable. Um, if they were evaluated, what's the score mean? What's the score variance? What's the coefficient of variation? What's the label majority? And then what's the label entropy? This is, a, this is like the variance of the label. It's a, it's a variance for discrete um, distributions. And uh, if the entropy is zero, that means everybody gave it the same label. If, the, if it's not, that means the distributions are spread a little bit. All right, so that's what it's doing for every case. And, but it returns a list element. So, um, uh, so that's not very easy to use. So the first thing I do is turn it into a data frame um, with this function. It's a little complicated. I wanna describe how, but ultimately what we have is, let me show you, here's our results training crowd, which is a big list of all sorts of stuff. You can see it has a, a variable, the readers, the cases, the modality ID, here's the data frame corresponding to the training set in the crowd. Um, and then here's all sorts of statistics that it returned. So let's look at one, and because I grouped these by the, the mean score. And then you can see what I just showed you. We got a batch, we got a WSI, we got a case ID, modality, a number of observations, the score mean, and that, and that coefficient of variance. Let me just show what it looks like. So it's a data frame. That's, that's nice. I like to get everything in a data frame because then it's easy to understand what you got. Uh, we have the bash, WSI, case ID, modality ID, and then we have the, the do stats information. How many observations were collected for this case? How many of those were evaluable and how many were not evaluable? And then if there were evaluable ones, what's the mean of the scores? And what's the variance of the score? So obviously these three observations were all zero because the score mean and score variance are zero. And uh, that causes a problem for coefficient of variation, but what can you do? And uh, the majority though, were these six that all called this case an other region, all right? So what we need to see is score mean, score variance, if there were scores, evaluable. And then 
It will also have the label majority. So when it's like an even split, like two said one thing and another two said another thing, we um, the label majority indicates that. And then the label entropy tells us about the variance of the label. So you can see when they have more labels, we got a higher variance, a label variance, uh, entropy. Okay, so you're starting to see how my crazy mind works um, and uh, starting to see some of these data objects. And I just wanted to show you that, that the, the, the mechanism here is I split by uh, one of my factors because then this function can deal with that smaller component uh, very directly. So do stats by case takes a data frame of observations for one case and does it for every element in the list. And then there's a little bit of repackaging that happens so that we get this nice data frame. All right, uh, any questions? The last thing I wanna do is talk about the agreement and so I'm saying it loud enough so people are doing the emails while the basic stuff has been happening. Um, this is an agreement of approach to agreement for this, the pathologists that are estimating quantitative um, values. Uh, and it's an AUC, it's built on AUC. So I'm gonna run this sucker. Actually, I wanna do, sorry, I wanted to do, Wanted to binge show. I wanted to show a binary analysis first, because this is something you got, everybody can kind of understand without a lot of uh, without a lot of discussion. We got a, a reader from the truth. We have a reader from the crowd, and there's our names, our IDs, and now we have a full three by three table where we've applied the threshold when there was a score. And then we've kept track of when the person said it was not a valuable. So that's why we got three categories in both axes. Anybody have any questions about this? A case will either be not a valuable or it will have a score. And that score will either be below 10 or above 10. All right. And the function that does this, you know, allows you to change the threshold. So it's um flexible like that. The function itself uh, allows you to pick the readers um, and the threshold so that you build out this three by three table. I want to make sure this is, this is the first step that they do in their, in their data collection is they label the data as evaluable or not. And then the next step is to score it. And then but I'm already applying the threshold to the ones that they scored. So we get this nice type two by three table. And now the analysis that I'm gonna do is gonna isolate the two by two submatrix of bin score. So when they score it, when both readers score it, we got this little two by two table, 22, two, zero, and 23. And so we can do a two positive fractions, fraction and a true negative fraction of specificity. Now to deal with the not valuable because we, that's what we realized is driving a lot of our variability is when people are calling things valuable and when they're calling it not a value. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna bin everything related to a score for each reader. That we have 22, 23, and two is 47. Four and seven is 11. And then zero and one are one. Everybody understand how I got this two by two table about evaluable versus not evaluable. And, and the back to somebody's question about the VTA, um, that is a binary true false. We could have got the table that way. All right, but I'm showing you how it's related to um, this full three by three table. All right, and then we can do a true positive fraction and a true negative fraction on this two by two table. And this is where um, we had a little less agreement. What we see up here is on the, when, when they both score a case, they do pretty good. You know, this one actually does pretty perfect on um, the lower scores. Uh, and 
pretty darn good on the higher score. So we're going to look at that over different thresholds. Now, 10 is a clinically identified threshold, as is 40. But we could do this for any threshold and see how that changes as a function of the threshold. And that's where um, you know a lot of these um, things are about um, agreement on the score. But if we interrogate several thresholds, we are actually learning something about the calibration of the readers as well. And that's where I'm going to go to the AUC right now. But I'm going to pause first to make sure, because this is, this is key. If you understand this, you're in good shape. All right, I'm going to get to the AUC part. And that's where um, it's a kind of a new, fresh look at things, at least from my standpoint. Uh, I'm running something underneath. Uh, what we have, I'm going to walk through the figures because that's the way I understand and I think that's a way that everybody can understand. So we have a pair of readers. Uh, we have one truth reader and we have one um, crowd reader. And this is the scatter plot of their scores. So you can see it's not like most scatter plots which have the line of equality and all the points kind of scattered around the line of equality. Welcome to human data. This is what makes the, the analysis chain challenging. Uh, I mean, this truth uh, pathologist scored all of these cases at or near zero. And meanwhile, the crowd pathologist scored this one up at 75. So we got a zero and a 75 as their data. Well, how, how in the world did that happen? But it happens with this kind of data. And humans are not good at absolute score scoring. Um, and, uh, but we want them to try. And, and give a, a score, a density value that is uh, on the continuous scale. But once we do, it's kind of hard. What do we do with this data? So we showed binarizing both the truth and the crowd. Well, let's first binarize the truth. So everything below 10 for the, was assigned a true label of zero temporarily. And all the scores that were above 10 were given a, a label of one. All right, so now you can see how um, the crowd pathologist did at scoring these. At least all of these are more to the left than the ones up here. And so that's the process of getting to, uh, now this is ROC data because the truth is binary and the, and the crowd pathologist is continuous. Everybody happy with this figure? And then what do we do with that data? We can get ROC curve. So the dashed lines are for multiple crowd pathologists. And then the dark line is the average of those. So we take little slices on the 45 degree angle and everywhere that the individual reader intersects, we take those values to get the average. And what we've learned is um, that the average of the AUCs from our crowd is equal to the, is equal to the area under the ROC curve of the average ROC. Um, and this is uh, something Weiji uh, identified and put into code. So this is the kind of a plan I'm exploring right now. Um, that way we can get a single number for each threshold. And we look at the clinical thresholds and maybe we look at multiple thresholds to see how this AUC curve changes as a function of threshold. And quick looks at the data have been um, finding that it's not ugly. I mean, it's starting to behave like something that we can analyze. So, Brandon, these are only the crowd pathologists against one right. um, expert? Yeah, I mean, I'm building up the infrastructure to do it for all the, the reference pathologists, all the truthing pathologists, in order to average. Uh, and then we'll probably do something like bootstrapping to average to, to understand the variance <laughs> across truthers. Okay. In its case, and its ROI has a different count of um, expert reviewers, right? Yes, that's right. Every time you take a pair of readers, you know, um, you uh, I'm reducing the data down to the the data that they both see. 
Um, and so that's why it's important to look at the, the threshold performance, because that's step one, about the valuable and not valuable, especially this performance. And then once conditional on cases that are valuable, then we see the RLC curve. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. And uh, some of you might have been waiting the whole time for this little discussion. Um, and hopefully you stuck it out, um, but I'm happy to, to discuss further. Does the package now include all the analysis, the, the modeling or the ANOVA analysis that uh, she had uh, done? Or not no, yet. So her, she's about to resubmit her paper, um, but her she has a repository that um, that is in the public domain already, and it's separate. I from see. This one. Okay. Um, let me grab it for you. So we were doing our initial steps in in analyzing this data was to use limits of agreement, but the. Um, data just doesn't satisfy the assumptions that you should have for that kind of analysis. I mean, it still is interesting to see the mean squared differences. Um, tells you something about how much variability there is. But, um, you know, when you start trying to build a hypothesis test and confidence intervals, uh, my statistician friends were, were up in arms. This is this is totally not satisfying the assumptions of a bland Altman analysis. You can't average over this axis, and we were pooling, and 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 I totally agree that that is, those pooling and things are inappropriate. It still gives us a good look at um, information, but uh, the ANOVA work that I and C Wen have been doing. Well, I guess I sent that only to one person. I didn't mean to. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's still going to maybe be useful in other situations, maybe where readers are not, at, or better at the quantitative numbers. Um, but, uh, for this data, we started moving into, um, methods that treat the data as ordinal. That's what you just saw with the ROC curves and, and binning. So, but we'll look at multiple thresholds, um, in doing that. Um, I'm going to answer a question that just came. I mean, uh, the, there's, we're working towards a publication that would have this last part. So this is, this is still a work in progress. You know, I really want to be able to do the average over the, the reference standard pathologists, you know, that's, that's one more piece, um, and get the variability of that, and then look at that as a function of the threshold, um, and, and make some pretty plots showing all those results, but. Uh, that's still a work in progress. I won't follow up on that. Actually, you did mention mean squared difference as a figure of merit here. Uh, and I'm just trying to think how these uh, ROC analysis and mean squared difference are reconciling with each other. Um, so what I'm going to do, and, and uh, happy for someone to um, ask other questions while I'm getting there, um, but I'm going to go to the pathology informatics talk. Um, I think that might be a good place to go. Um, oh, I did want to show, this is the landing page for our project hub. Um, this is the first wiki page, which has a lot of great information, including this line about publications, presentations, and studies. What's here is a, a link to our Zotero library. And this is where our, all the presentations that we've created in this project, kind of new for my HTTP collaborators to see it this way. Um, but basically here is my pathology informatics item. And then if you go to the URL down here, uh, it'll open up. We have a special wiki page about it, including the slides. And, uh, I'm going to open the slides real quick because I don't know if I have the bland Altman plot showing. Um, but hopefully I did. It was at least in a version. So yeah, it's two completely different analyses though. I mean, uh, one is looking at the quantitative differences and the other is, uh, you know, looking only at rank ordering. Uh, 
let's see. There's progress. All right, so this is one place that says the mean as a function of the variance or coefficient of variance is very different across this range. So it's really hard to argue that you can pool it in any analysis. So what we've been doing is pooling at the low, medium, and high ranges. Uh, that's a little bit more defensible, although not everybody would agree with that. Right, and here's the mean as a, the variance as a function of the mean. So you can see um, there's really interesting things happening at low, medium, and high values. And then when we build the scatter plots, which is what the mean squared difference comes from, this is what you see. And uh, this is just ugly uh, because we have, we have school, paired scores that cover the entire range. So this person gave it a one and this person gave it an 80. There's an 80, you know, there's, there's all of this data that's really hard to reconcile. Um, what I'm showing is uh, the entire crowd on the left. And then we selected out people that did the entire study thinking that they were more invested in the effort. And sure enough, they were a little better at um, being correlated. Uh, I'll show a couple more of those. This is the mid range. This was the, the mean scores that were between zero and 10. These are the ones that are between 10 and 40. And these are the ones that are above 40. These are log scaled, otherwise you really can't see anything. And just so you know, the large circles correspond to observations that have multiple observations. So this largest circle corresponds to 982 observations, all right? And then the smallest corresponds to one. And, uh, and then they're linearly scaled between those. Um, and so we looked at limits of agreement, which if you know Bland Altman and you know mean square differences, limits of agreement are two times the standard deviation of your mean square difference. The, so you get your mean square difference, take the square root, multiply it by two, that's what limits of agreement are. And this limits of agreement accounts for case variability and the reader variability, all right? And so we can see that for all the readers, we had uh, pretty big numbers here. I mean, when you think about it, we're, at, we're between zero and 10, but our confidence interval or our limits of agreement go beyond that range. Uh, and then as we get up in the middle range, we're at 38 and 66. Now, when we look at the panel of four, which are, which are pathologists that did the whole study, um, they're better, they're better for sure, but um, they're, not, um, they're not a measurement device. I mean, they're not a computer. Artificial intelligence and, and deep learning is going to be a, a million times better, I believe. Uh, and you know the scatter plots are going to look much more closer from two machine learning algorithms, hopefully, uh, depending on how they behave. And so that's um, I think that answers your question. So in a way, um, Brandon, if I extend what you're saying, then if you're Testing the performance of the algorithm against the experts is not going to be very difficult in this case, you know, to, to match, I guess. Well, this is where we're coming to, like, uh, the, FG, the role of the FDA is what is the reference standard for measuring um, this till density biomarker? And the only thing we have is the human pathologist. And so we're trying to train up the pathologist to be more like our experts. And, and it's a little bit about the instructions they were giving and then whether they did mm -hmm. did not do the training. I mean, it makes a big yep. difference. And then um, uh, once an algorithm shows that it's at least as good as the pathologist, which probably is not gonna be that hard to show, yeah. um, then maybe the, the artificial intelligence will start being the reference standard for, the yeah. for this very narrow task. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's really why uh, computational pathology is, is booming and certainly why quantitative imaging and algorithms with images have um, been so such a robust area of research and development.
All right, I'm still here. Any other questions? Uh, I, I do have one more question actually. So I think one of the questions with which comes with AI too is how reproducible is AI itself going to be? Uh, so do you think that this could be a mechanism to uh, also demonstrate AI reproducibility? Um, re how do I always thought AI, you give it one answer, you give the same answer out. So, well, there are two things here, right? There's, of course, the algorithmic uncertainties, the model based uncertainty itself, uh, and the epistemic uncertainty. But I'm referring to a third source of uncertainty here, which is in the realm of uh, your network, the same network being trained by different data sets. So, sure, this will be able to kind of address that. Um, ultimately, we're trying to have a way of evaluating whether the algorithm is as good as the pathologists. And so the, what makes things complicated for this business is that we have multiple readers involved um, on the truthing side, at a minimum on the truthing side. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what makes the analysis a little bit harder. Um, so you can imagine though, you can take one algorithm and another and do them head to head if you wanted to do. And I think you do a similar analysis and you would not have the multiple reader complexity. The other complexity that we're, we're trying to overcome is that we've got multiple regions of interest for each image. And there's a correlation there. Um, any, all the regions of interest within a case are correlated. And uh, we're not totally up to speed on how to do that. Um, actually, we're close to submitting a paper on that for, um, for the single reader, but the multiple reader is, uh, is the next up. And we've already figured out the method, but you know all the validation simulations and then writing the paper is still a thing to come. So when I showed you the AEC stuff, what was great about, what I'm happy about is that um, you know, it treats the multiple crowd pathologists for each reader that variability, it, it, um, it accounts for the variability from the reader and the correlations from the readers reading the same cases. I mean, we have something similar uh, in the segmentation, image segmentation literature, right? Where we have this huge problem of inter and interrelated variability when you're trying to delineate tumor boundaries. And if I well, to... you are, you're pointing at staple, I'm, get, I'm sure, is a part of your toolbox. Staple is a part of our toolbox, but even with staple, we observe that, uh, it, I mean, there is variability. And so one of the questions that arises is, well, here is a new method that we are developing. Uh, how are we going to know whether it is accurate? Well, you have DICE scores and other metrics to look at. And if you're looking at a task, then you can look at tumor volume and see how accurate the tumor volume is that's being estimated or how precise it is. But then the question of variability becomes uh, rather of, uh, Reproducibility uh, becomes a more interesting one. Uh, how do you assess the, the reproducibility of the AI algorithm itself when it was it is going to be taken to some other institution or with some other scanner where it is now being trained on a new data set? And I, I don't know if I have a, or if it is being trained by annotations from different readers. So I'm thinking about this in the context of, uh, of the third case where it is being annotated, by, uh, trained with annotations from different readers, which is very much a possibility. Yes, and um, I mean, we, my colleagues and I here at the FDA, this is something we are, have thought about and look at, and we have definitely um, made written papers and, and discussed the issue of how do you assess uh, training variability, which is mm -hmm. what you're talking about. Um, uh, our, 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 our antler plots where it shows how the training impacts and the size of the training set impacts the performance um, and uh, the very, how, how can you resample to try and uh, tease out the training variability from the, the, the variability that's from testing. You know, and we'd use a lot of simulations and models to try to, in order to control a lot, a lot of that variability uh, or to control the sampling so we can have Super, super big sizes and, and think that we're, um, we're representing the, the true distribution uh, rather than the finite distribution. Um, and that's work by uh, Wei Ji Chen uh, and, and myself. Uh, 
Berkman Shiner also who just left and uh, those tools have, are out there uh, probably getting close to 10 years old now and, I, and I, I'm going to guess that you have actually seen them. Yeah, let me follow up on that uh, with you and, and VJ. Thank you very much, Brandon. Very nice presentation. Sure. See you later, Abhinav. Yes, yeah, see you there. Mohammed, you're still here. Yeah, I'm still here. It's uh, very enlightening, actually. Uh, any any lingering questions or just listening to the discussion? I was just getting the general gist and uh, just wanted to understand the data frames better because that's where my uh, main questions were. So I think that's clearer now. Good, good. If you have any follow-ups, just, just email me. No problem. Sure. Well, thank you so much. That, that was very, very good. Thanks. Anybody else? I skipped lunch. This is a I'm, lot going of to, I'm going to stop the recording in case anyone had a question they didn't want recorded. Sure.